You are listening to Gone But Never Forgotten. Our topics can include, but are not limited to, murder, sexual assault, graphic and gruesome details, and more. These topics are adult in nature and are not meant for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Oftentimes, as we are growing up, people tell us things like, it could always be worse, or they tell us that we're exaggerating our situations. But the reality is that sometimes there are stories going on like the one that we are going to talk about here today. In the past, we have talked about people in positions of power or people who have jobs that we entrust our children to. But this week, we are going to talk about one of the worsts of the worst as far as crimes go, in my mind. We are going to talk about a woman who was convicted of torturing and killing two of her six children while also using and abusing her other children to help and hide her crimes. Hello, and welcome to episode 64 of Gone But Never Forgotten, Mother, Who Art Thou? The Teresa Knorr Story. Hello everyone and welcome back to Gone But Never Forgotten. Thank you again for taking time out of your week to spend listening to my voice and listening to another story of true crime that sadly takes place in our midst to some extent every single day of our lives. This week we're going to talk about many lives that were altered and even ended at the hands of an American woman who now thankfully calls the California Institution for Women in Chino, California, home. Before we jump right into the case here, I do want to thank our long-term patrons on the show, Stacy and Michelle, for supporting GBNF every single month. Every little bit helps, and you guys have been supporting the show for a long time. So thank you so much for that. Remember that you too can sign up on Patreon to support the show, and along with different perks at each level, you also get a weekly video of me discussing the week's case a little more in depth and personally, if that kind of thing is your jam. If Patreon isn't your thing, please follow me along on social media, as I do try to be active everywhere and love to interact with you, our fans. Without any further ado, though, let's take a look at another sad and crazy tale. Teresa Jimmy Francine Knorr, born Cross, was born on March 14, 1946 in Sacramento, California, and she was the youngest of three children to Swanee Gay and James Cross. Teresa's mother had a son and a daughter, William and Clara, from a previous marriage. James worked as an assistant cheesemaker at Golden State Dairy in Sacramento, and Swanee worked at a timber company. In the late 1950s, though, James was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, which meant that he needed to quit his job, and because of that, he did develop depression, and it has been reported, though not proven in a court of law, that he was abusive towards his family as the depression set in. Swanee was able to work jobs and keep the family afloat for a period of time. Swanee, however, did pass away in March of 1961 from congestive heart failure in Teresa's arms while they were shopping. When Swanee passed away, James had to sell the family home because he was unable to keep up payments on it. The death of her mother impacted Teresa greatly, and she also fell into depression. Less than a year after the death of her mom, Teresa would get married for the first time when she was only 16 years old. 
Her first husband was Clifford Clyde Sanders. He was 21, and they got married after only meeting a few months before they tied the knot, on September 29th, 1962. Immediately after they got married, Teresa would drop out of high school, and she got pregnant soon thereafter as well. On July 16th of 1963, Teresa would give birth to Howard Clyde Sanders. To say the marriage between Clifford and Teresa was rocky would be an understatement. Teresa was very possessive and controlling, and she reported always, reportedly always was accusing Clifford of cheating on her. Then, on June 22nd of 1964, Teresa would report to police that Clifford had punched her in the face during one of their arguments. She, however, refused to press charges, and so there was only a record of the alleged incident. On July 6th of 1964, one day after Clifford's birthday, things would escalate again. This time, Teresa was yelling at Clifford because he had spent his birthday with friends instead of at home with his family. Clifford finally managed to speak up for himself, and he told Teresa that he was going to leave her. At that, Teresa became incredibly angry, and she shot Clifford in the back with a rifle, killing him. Teresa would be arrested and charged officially with Clifford's murder, and she would in turn plead not guilty. Her claim was that she shot Clifford in self-defense. During the trial, as Teresa was pregnant with the couple's second child, she would say that she had to shoot Clifford because he was a violent alcoholic and he had previously assaulted her and abused her. Consequently, however, many members of Clifford's family would testify that he was never violent and he was never abusive, especially towards his family. The prosecution would frame their case around saying that Teresa had killed Clifford without any provocation. During the trial, Teresa's own sister would even take the stand and testify against her. She said that Teresa was incredibly possessive and jealous of everything that Clifford did. She stated that Teresa had even told people in the past that she would kill Clifford before she would allow any other woman to have him. As such, him saying that he was leaving was the only provocation that she would need. The case would wind up in an acquittal for Teresa on September 22nd of 1964. She would then give birth to her second child on March 16th of 1965. This child was a daughter, and she was named Sheila Gay Sanders. Unfortunately, Teresa would continue to spiral in the depression that her life had given her to this point, and she also began drinking very heavily. Teresa would become a regular at the local Legion Hall, where she would meet Estelle Thornsbury. Estelle was a disabled member of the United States Army, and the two would strike up a fast friendship and relationship, which eventually led to the two living together as well. The relationship did not progress past that, however, as Teresa started to leave her children at home with Estelle while she went out drinking, and at times, she would disappear for days at a time. Estelle finally realized that he had had enough when he found out that Teresa was cheating on him with one of his best friends. He told her that co that, that, combined with all of her wild ways, her drinking problems, and other issues were enough, and he ended the relationship. From there, Teresa would start a relationship with Robert Knorr who was in the United States Marine Corps. She would again get pregnant, and they would get married on July 9th of 1966. <clears throat> the two would end up having four children together. Susan Marlene Knorr was born on September 27th, 1966. William Robert Knorr was born on September 15th, 1967. Robert Wallace Knorr, Jr. was born on December 31st of 1968, and Teresa Marie Knorr was born on August 5th, 1970. Susan, William, and Robert were born while Robert and Teresa were still together. 
As we saw in her relationship with Clifford, Teresa would continually say that she believed that Robert was cheating on her, and she filed for a divorce from him on June 3, 1970, while she was pregnant with their fourth child. Teresa was born two months after the divorce filings, and even though Robert tried to see his children, that was in vain because Teresa blocked him at every single turn. Teresa would get married twice more, and both marriages would be about the same. Lots of abuse, lots of accusations, and they eventually ended in divorce. Her third marriage was to a railway worker named Ronald Pullum, and her final marriage was to a copy editor for the Sacramento Union named Chester Harris. Susan, one of the daughters, would become very close with Chester, and that caused Teresa to get very jealous of their relationship. The abuse that took place in Teresa's relationships was sadly not just contained between herself and her husbands, neither. Teresa had started to be abusive towards her children, physically, mentally, and verbally. And after her fourth divorce, the abuse would get progressively worse as she took out all of her anger on them. Teresa also kept to herself and put a lot of weight on after her last divorce. Not only did she become a recluse, but she also forced her children to become reclusive as well. The kids were never allowed to have friends over, and the home itself was not in good shape. The apartment smelled like urine, and neighbors said that when they did see the children, they could tell that things were not all right. The kids were high-strung, they were unkempt, and they seemed to be afraid of everything. Now, when I say abuse, I'm sure that most of us think of being hit or spanked, but this was abuse to an entirely different degree than what most of us are familiar with, thankfully. Teresa would torture her children. She did beat them, but she would also throw knives at her children, burn them with her cigarettes, and she would even make her children help as she abused the other children. Teresa would make other children hold down their siblings while she would beat them. It was even reported that at one time, Teresa would hold down Terry, her youngest daughter, and hold a gun to her head while she threatened to kill her. Most of the abuse was directed at the two older sisters, Susan and Sheila. Later, Terry would say that their mother was incredibly resentful of the older girls who were maturing and looking very attractive, while Teresa was wasting away, getting older, and putting on more and more weight. Teresa also believed that Chester had turned Susan into a witch, and because of that, Susan was on the receiving end of the worst of the abuse. Susan would finally run away after one of the bouts of abuse, and she would be picked up by police, and they placed her in a psychiatric ward, where she opened up and told the staff about everything that her mother did to her and to the other children. Teresa, however, would tell the police that Susan was lying and that she had mental issues. Sadly, as we do see far too often, Authorities just took Teresa's word for Susan's actions and released her back into Teresa's custody. In response to speaking out, Teresa beat Susan and also had her siblings beat her as well, and she would handcuff Susan to the kitchen table and get her other children to ensure that Susan did not get loose or get away. Teresa also pulled all of her children out of school. That was not where it ended for Susan, unfortunately. Teresa would continue to handcuff Susan un under the dining table for two years, and she would only be fed from time to time, and she could only eat when she was wearing a mouth gag. Things, though, believe it or not, only escalated from there. Susan would beg for her mom to let her leave, and she said that she wouldn't tell anyone else what was happening in that house. But that just made Teresa even more angry, and she started to beat all of her children more and more ferociously. Teresa would uncuff Susan, but she gave a gun to Terry, her youngest child, and told her not to let Susan go anywhere. 
Terry held the gun there as the rest of the family was cooking together. Later on, Teresa would get so infuriated that she would shoot Susan in the chest. Teresa, against the pleading of Susan, refused to take her to the hospital and instead handcuffed her hands again and left her bleeding under the table while also getting angry with everyone because blood was getting on her carpet. I'm going to pause here because all of this is just crazy. As a parent, I can say that there are times that you feel like you're being too harsh or you just can't bear to punish your children, and you question yourself a lot. But this, all of this, this is just crazy. I don't know how anyone treats another person like this, much less their own flesh and blood. I don't care what reasons you think that you have to punish someone like this, your reason is not valid. That is a lot to read or listen to. Teresa eventually decided to try to help Susan after Susan asked for her mother's permission to leave once and for all, and shockingly, Teresa agreed. There was one condition, though. Susan needed to let Teresa get the bullet out of her back that was lodged from the shooting so that there was no evidence. The wound had developed sepsis and infection, and Susan's flesh was discolored. After that, Teresa would pack up all of Susan's things into garbage bags, and then she would have the other children help her to bind Susan's arms and legs. Susan would also have her mouth duct taped, and Robert and William would be ordered by their own mother to load Susan and her belongings into the car. The four would drive to Squaw Valley, and Robert and William would put Susan on the side of the road on top of the garbage bags that had all of her things inside of them. Teresa told her children that Susan's wounds were from the devil, and that they needed to deal with those wounds with fire. Teresa would then cover Susan and all of her belongings in gasoline, and set her and all of those things on fire. The three of them just then left her there. Susan's body was still smoldering the next day when it was found. The body was in such an ill state that a positive identification was actually never made on the body. As such, all of the information was filed away as a Jane Doe homicide case, meaning that the authorities knew that this was murder, but they had nowhere to start because they had no idea who the victim was. And now... Teresa had murdered the person that was taking the brunt of her abuse, and because of that, she would turn her attention towards Sheila. She forced her own daughter into prostitution in May of 1985 because she was going to use Sheila to support the family. Teresa was quite pleased with herself when she realized how much money Sheila was making as a sex worker. Teresa, though, as she was prone to do turned on a dime, and she turned on Sheila and started to say that Sheila had gotten pregnant and she had caught an STD, something that Teresa would also say she caught from Sheila because they shared a toilet seat. Sheila told her mom that none of that was true, though, but Sheila was beaten for lying and then hogtied and locked in a closet that had no ventilation. Teresa then told her other children that they were not to give Sheila air, food, or water. What the kids believed was that Teresa wanted Sheila to simply confess to the things that she was being accused of. Finally, Sheila did just that to try to put an end to the punishment and said that she had gotten pregnant and she did have STDs. However, Teresa would again say that Sheila was lying and refused to let her out of the closet. Three days later, on June 21st, 1985, Sheila would die from dehydration and starvation. That meant that in less than a year, Teresa had directly caused the death of two of her own daughters. As a message to the other children, Teresa would leave Sheila's body in the closet for three more days after she had died. Finally, she again would get William and Robert to remove the body. They would put Sheila into a cardboard box and dispose of it near the Truckee Tahoe Airport. 
Sheila's body would mercifully be discovered only hours after it was disposed of. However, again, likely because of no records really of the children, dental or medical, her body was not identified, and she too was listed as a Jane Doe. The smell from Sheila's body decomposing for three days had permeated the entire apartment, and Teresa knew that they had to act fast to get rid of evidence. She moved all of the family's belongings out of the apartment and had Terry use lighter fluid to attempt to set a fire. However, neighbors would call the fire in and it was put out. No damage was done to the closet. At this point, the family would scatter over the next five years. By 1991, all of the children had moved away from Teresa except for Robert Jr., who was now 19. Robert Jr. and Teresa actually wound up moving away to Las Vegas. In Las Vegas, Robert Jr. would take after his mother. He would shoot and kill a bartender and be given 16 years in prison. Now alone, Teresa moved to Salt Lake City, Utah. And now we get back to how everything went down. Terry, the youngest daughter, had tried to tell police and also a therapist about what Teresa put all of her children through, and about the two murders. Everyone that she told, though, dismissed her stories and did not act upon them. On October 28th of 1993, Terry would decide to further take matters into her own hands, and she did what we have seen before in previous cases. She went to America's Most Wanted with her story. America's Most Wanted told Terry to contact police in California where Susan's body had been found so that they could corroborate evidence. They then worked to combine the two Jane Doe cases with the story that Terry was telling and everything started to fit together like a puzzle. William Knorr would be arrested on November 4th of 1993. Then, on November 15th of 1993, Teresa Knorr would be officially charged with two counts of murder, two counts of conspiracy to commit murder, and also murder by torture and multiple murder. Teresa would plead not guilty at first, but she then was forced into making a deal with the prosecution because she found out and her team found out that Robert Jr. had agreed to testify against her. He was motivated by getting out of jail sooner for the murder that he had committed. The deal was that Teresa would plead guilty as long as she would be spared from the death penalty. She was sentenced on October 17th of 1995 to two consecutive life sentences. Teresa had her most recent parole hearing in 2019, and she will be up again for parole in July of 2024. Let's hope that she stays right where she is, behind bars. This woman caused so much damage and so much trauma to everyone that came in contact with her, it seems, not to mention the fact that she actually did kill two of her own children. She does not deserve to ever see the light of day with early parole, in my personal opinion. If you're interested in this case and learning more, you can watch Cold Case Files, and the episode contains an exclusive interview with Terry Knorr Walker, Teresa's youngest daughter. The case was also covered by Wicked Attraction, Evil Lives Here, Deadly Women, and Most Evil. Finally, you can watch a loosely adapted version of events by watching the 2010 horror movie, The Afflicted. I don't know how to turn this episode away from the dark and dreary, as there's certainly not much that is more shocking than family killing family. I think that I want to, all I want to add is that I certainly hope that nowadays people take abuse reporting more seriously, and I hope that there are less stories of children who escaped, told the truth, were rejected, and later were beaten more or worse, like Susan, because people didn't believe the stories that were being told. It truly breaks my heart. To all of you goners out there, thank you. Thank you for listening each and every week, 
and thank you for supporting the show. Come back next week right here for another true crime story courtesy of Gone But Never Forgotten. Be better.